Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. From the movie Dr. Strangelove. Oh, hi. Mr. Lahasky here. And today, we step into the nuclear age with a discussion of the Cold War's origins and its course through the early 60s. In 1945, Allied forces entered Berlin amid the collapse of Adolf Hitler's regime. The Allies were led by the Americans on Germany's Western Front and by the Russians in the East. United by the common enemy, the US and Soviet Union managed to cooperate just enough to bring down the Axis powers. But the post-war honeymoon was short-lived. An intense rivalry soon developed between the emerging superpowers, one that brought the planet to the brink of nuclear war on more than one occasion. The origin of this Cold War is the subject of today's lecture. But first, let's ask a big question. Does a powerful military render war more or less likely? The United States and its people have always had a peculiar relationship with standing armies. The American colonists developed a disdain for British regulars that was a focal point of the American independence movement. The founders saw a large standing army as an instrument of tyranny, and for the first 150 years of the country's history, that belief prevailed. However, general consensus around U.S. military forces began to change during and after World War II. In 1940, the United States established its first peacetime draft and built up its armed forces in anticipation of joining the war. At the war's conclusion, many Americans continued to favor a strong standing army, one that was now equipped with nuclear weapons for the first time. The nuclear age gave rise to changes in warfare and diplomacy, and the resulting Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union witnessed incredible increases in military spending and a buildup of destructive power sufficient to wipe out all of humanity. But did the change in paradigm that permitted this military buildup make us safer? Did it deter military action against us and our allies? Or did it bring us unnecessarily to the brink of annihilation? Let's look inside the Cold War, then you decide. Our first big idea traces the origins of the Cold War by laying out the American and Russian positions at the conclusion of World War II. The United States and Soviet Union emerged from World War II as global superpowers, but incompatible political and economic worldviews quickly bred tensions between the two countries. In 1945, American and Soviet soldiers converged on Berlin bringing an end to the Second World War. The war had lifted both nations out of the Great Depression and jump-started their economies. After the surrender of the Axis, the US and USSR were clearly global superpowers and the two nations best positioned to influence the post-war order. However, an aura of mistrust had been building between the two for quite some time. The Soviet Union, of course, was a communist dictatorship that vested all power in its premier, Joseph Stalin. Stalin was a brutal dictator and a human rights disaster. Even before America entered World War II, there was hesitation from many Americans about getting into bed with the Russians. But at the time, Hitler posed a bigger threat, and the Soviets became an ally of convenience. After the war ended, however, it was clear that the relationship between the U.S., and the USSR was not built to last. Three examples explain. First, in 1945, at a post-war meeting of the United Nations, the Soviets rejected a proposal that would have regulated nuclear energy and outlawed all nuclear weapons. At the time, the United States was the only country with the atomic bomb, so the rejection of the proposal signaled to Americans that the Soviets were working on a bomb of their own, and that they had no intention to stop. The United States also offered the Soviets a participating role in the World Bank, a new international institution established to provide loans for rebuilding nations. Communists in the Soviet Union, however, saw the World Bank as an instrument of capitalism, one that violated their basic economic principles, so they declined to participate in the effort. Third, U.S.-Soviet tensions rose when the Soviet Union expanded into Eastern Europe. At the Yalta Conference in 1945, Stalin had committed to democratic elections in the liberated nations of Central and Eastern Europe, places like Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. However, Russian interference in these elections 
produced communist leaders loyal to Moscow. They formed so-called satellite states for Stalin. They were independent nations, but in name only, taking their cues directly from the Soviet premier. These satellite states formed a buffer and a border between communism and capitalism in Europe. In a 1946 speech delivered in Missouri, Winston Churchill proclaimed ominously that an iron curtain had descended on Europe. As Americans increasingly interpreted Soviet actions as a threat to their own security and way of life, a new foreign policy strategy emerged that would guide U.S. actions for much of the next four decades. This is our second big idea. In order to stop the spread of communism in Europe and Asia, the United States adopted a strategy of containment. This policy resulted in heightened tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. And after a confrontation over Berlin, the Cold War was clearly underway. Okay, so in order to get to the heart of this conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, we need to understand a few basic principles about Soviet communism. You'll remember from your world history class that, in theory, communism is an economic system in which the means of production are controlled by the workers. In a truly communist society, private ownership of property is not recognized because resources and profits are shared equally among all people. However, in practice, Soviet communism took the form of a dictatorship. The Soviet government was ruled by a single party, which exercised absolute control over the economy. Of course, this feels a lot like good old-fashioned tyranny, and Americans were understandably opposed to it. Another thing you should remember about communism, it was designed to spread. The father of the ideology, Karl Marx, envisioned communism as a global system, one that would rise through violent revolutions around the world. With this in mind in the late 1940s, President Harry S. Truman warned that if left unchecked in Eastern Europe, communism would spread to more of the Soviet Union's neighbors. This domino effect would eventually threaten democracy in Western Europe and even the United States. To combat this outcome, Truman and his successors adopted a strategy of containment. The goal of containment was to stop communism from spreading further, and the United States dedicated billions of dollars and later hundreds of thousands of soldiers to this goal. Containment policy began when the United States provided financial aid to European nations in the late 1940s. World War II had decimated economies across Europe, and many countries found themselves in economic despair at the conclusion of the war. American leaders recognized that areas of economic destitution were most at risk for communist revolutions, as desperate people were more likely to turn to radical solutions. In March 1947, Greece and Turkey seemed likely candidates for communist activity, so Truman sent $400 million in economic aid to those countries to support their rebuilding efforts. This financial support of non-communist countries became known as the Truman Doctrine, and it worked. In June 1947, Secretary of State George Marshall proposed an even larger economic commitment abroad. His plan sent more than $12 billion to countries in Western Europe to facilitate their rebuilding efforts. The Marshall Plan had two main goals. First, by investing in European countries, the U.S. was able to help improve economic conditions there and ward off the threat of communist uprisings. And second, the plan helped the United States economy by establishing new channels for trade. But economic aid was only part of the broader containment strategy. And as relations between the United States and the Soviet Union continued to deteriorate, Germany became the scene of the first major confrontation between the two superpowers. Now, after Germany surrendered at the conclusion of World War II, the Allied powers had divided the conquered nation into four zones, each to be controlled by one of the four Allied countries, Britain, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union. The capital city of Berlin was located entirely within the Soviet zone, but because of the city's cultural and economic significance, it too was divided among the four powers. In 1948, as tensions rose between the East and West, the Americans, British, and French combined their zones to form West Germany and West Berlin, 
isolating Stalin in the process. Irritated with what appeared to be a conspiracy against him, Stalin took bold action to try to squeeze the Allies out of Berlin altogether. Soviet troops established blockades on the roads and railroads connecting West Berlin to West Germany. Without access to the capital, the Americans, British, and French would not be able to provide needed supplies to the city and would have to choose between abandoning Berlin to communism and a possible war with the Soviets. But as it turns out, there was a third option. What proceeded was the Berlin Airlift, a daring but historic achievement in aviation logistics. I'll defer to this quick clip that tells the story a little better than I can. June 1948, the Oval Office. The cabinet gathers for a conference with President Truman. Four days prior, the Soviet Union blockaded the American, British, and French occupied sectors of Berlin. With the divided city located a hundred miles inside the Soviet-controlled zone of East Germany, there's no way for American food and fuel, the lifeline of its undernourished populace, to get through. The city only has 36 days worth of food remaining, and only 45 days of coal. Allied troops are surrounded, outnumbered 62 to 1. The cabinet lays out three options. One, American forces could withdraw, but that would signal that Western democracies are unable to counter Soviet aggression. Two, they could stay in Berlin until the starving population forces them out and accepts Soviet rule out of desperation. Or three, they could send an armed convoy to open the roads, but that would start another world war. They advise Truman to withdraw. Truman says, we stay in Berlin, period. You see, after Germany's surrender in World War II, the Allies divided Germany into four occupation zones, the Soviets in the East, and the Americans, British, and French in the West, and Berlin, though it lay in the Soviet zone, was divided as well. The problem was that the Allies had two competing irreconcilable visions for Germany. The Soviets had suffered two German invasions in the span of 30 years. They wanted this country broken and subordinate, so it could never threaten Russia again. They also wanted it to function as a buffer zone to keep the Western powers at bay. In the end, Stalin's goal was a communist puppet state in Germany and the Allies out of Berlin. But America and Britain believed that Nazi extremism had arisen due to the Great Depression, and that the best chance for a peaceful Europe was a prosperous, democratic Germany. They also hoped that it would be a bulwark against Soviet expansionism. So this joint occupation effort was doomed to failure from the outset. But the final showdown came over currency. Berlin was in economic ruin. Allied bombing had destroyed most of its industrial foundation, and even three years after the war, most Berliners lived in the basements of shattered buildings. Some were living on just 900 calories a day. The biggest problem was the value of German currency, which was so low that a loaf of bread often cost an entire paycheck. The city's real currency at this point was American cigarettes, and most civilians survived by a combination of black market, food aid, and prostitution. The Allies made an attempt at currency reform, but this attempt failed when the Soviets sabotaged the effort by printing billions of extra notes. By 1948, the frustrated Western powers were secretly planning to introduce a new currency, the Deutschmark, and met behind Stalin's back to discuss forming a West German state. The Soviets found out about this, and in protest, abandoned the Four Power Council. In response, the Western Allies released the new currency, and Stalin had his pretext. On June 23rd, Soviet troops encircled Berlin, blockading the road and rail line the Allies had been using to supply the city. The city's power station, located in the Soviet sector, cut electricity. The Berlin blockade had begun, and Truman had to choose between retreat or war. But there was another possibility. The Soviets had interrupted traffic to Berlin before, months earlier, but the Allies had continued supplying their troops via air. Truman wondered whether a similar airlift could supply all of Berlin. After all, the only way you can stop a plane is to shoot at it, which would be an act of war. American generals dismissed this idea as impossible, but the Royal Air Force thought different. After years of war shortages, the British were experts in rationing, and they ran the numbers. They concluded that it would take 4,000 tons of food and fuel per day to keep Berlin from collapsing. But to move that much cargo in C-47 transports would mean over 1,300 flights every 24 hours, and only the Americans had that capacity. Under pressure from Truman, the U.S. generals agreed to try. The first flight began on June 26th. Despite Soviet threats, the anti-aircraft guns stayed silent. They had called Stalin's bluff. But the airlift didn't have enough planes or crews. The Air Force tried bringing in air wings from as far away as Guam, but it still wasn't enough. Two weeks in, the airlift was only delivering a thousand tons per day, a quarter of what they needed. And conditions were perilous. The American airport at Tempelhof was a grass field that needed to be patched between landings. An apartment block stood directly on the approach path, its roof just 17 feet below the landing gear. And those C-47s were old leftovers from the war. Coal and flour dust, both of which were explosive, by the way, filled the plane's cargo holds. The 24-hour nature of this operation strained both the airmen and their antiquated planes. And all the while, Soviet yak fighters buzzed the transports, keeping 
keeping the pressure on. But despite the shortfall on the cargo quota, the airlift spurred a wave of enthusiasm. Across Europe, people set aside wartime grudges in an effort to keep Berlin from starving. Blitz survivors in London sent care packages to Berlin. Many RAF mechanics didn't even wait to be called up, they just grabbed their toolboxes and hitched a flight to Hamburg. Germans, previously hostile to the pilots who had leveled their cities, instead began plying Allied airmen with beer. It was a chaotic cowboy operation. So Washington dispatched a man to tame it. General William Tunner was a taciturn man who loved him some charts. During the war, he had commanded an airlift that flew supplies over the Himalayas and into occupied China. Now, he was given the objective of delivering 4,000 tons per day. First thing first, he created a tight schedule. Planes would take off and land at precise three-minute intervals, and the flights would stack at five altitudes, maximizing the number of planes in the air. When the crews landed, they'd have 30 minutes to unload before taking off again. Tunner also enforced maintenance checks, brought in fresh U.S. Navy pilots, and replaced the C-47s with larger capacity C-54s. To make up for the ground crew shortage, he hired Germans to unload cargo and patch runways. And after translating the maintenance manuals, he assigned former Luftwaffe mechanics to repair planes. Men who had been shooting at each other only three years before now worked side by side. Tunner's shakeup worked. On August 12th, the airlift reached its target for the first time, 4,500 tons. Then, Tunner discovered that one of his pilots, Gail Halverson, had been making unauthorized cargo drops. Every time Halverson came in for a landing, he would drop off little handkerchief parachutes containing parcels of candy to the children that gathered near the runway. Berliners loved it, and Tunner saw the PR potential. He ordered the candy drops expanded and sent Halverson on a press tour back home. The airlift, a humanitarian effort without traditional military heroes, finally had a public face. And that PR victory was good news because winter was coming. The Soviets had been stalling diplomatically for exactly this reason. Surely deteriorating weather would put a stop to this airlift for good. Fog came in heavy that season. At times, it lay so thick on the runways that ground crews had to crawl for fear of walking into an unseen propeller. Aircraft landed in zero visibility with iced up engines. They collided in midair, they smashed into mountain ranges. Exhausted pilots fell asleep at the stick. Meteorologists, circling in B-29s, alerted ground control of 15-minute breaks in the weather that would allow flights to get through. And somehow, they did. On New Year's Eve 1948, Allied forces delivered over 6,000 tons, a new record. And as winter passed and the weather began to let up, the airlift began delivering more supplies than the city had ever received by rail. This success emboldened anti-Soviet politicians within Berlin. In September, Ernst Reuter, elected mayor in 1947 but blocked from taking his seat by the Soviets, gave a fiery speech before a crowd of 300,000 Berliners, imploring the world not to abandon the city to totalitarianism. That December, he won the mayor's office, appearing around the world as the face of free Berlin. In retaliation, the Soviets installed their own communist city government in East Berlin. Stalin's strategy had backfired. Instead of preventing a West German state, he had fueled it. Far from revealing Allied weaknesses, he had allowed them to take the moral high ground, demonstrating their commitment and turning Germans from an occupied people into comrades. And the blockade was damaging East Berlin's economy. Its factories couldn't function without goods from the Western sector. The Soviets had been outmaneuvered. On May 12, 1949, Soviet soldiers removed the roadblocks and allowed the first American supply convoy to pass into Berlin. That road would never close again. In 15 months of operation, the airlift delivered over 2.4 million tons of food and fuel, saving Berlin from famine. 79 Allied personnel and German civilians lost their lives to the effort, and the world would never be the same. Stalin's willingness to starve civilians marked a turning point, uniting Western Europe in a coalition to contain Soviet influence. A month before the end of the blockade, this new alliance, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, was formally signed into being. And within weeks, West Germany formally became its own country, followed by Communist East Germany. Europe was divided in half, and two months later, the Soviets tested their first atomic bomb. It was the beginning of a new kind of war, one of political influence, fought by great powers over proxy states. A war of threat and restraint, where governments tested just how far they could push the other without starting a full-scale conflict. But the Soviets and the Americans would never again square off as directly as they did during the airlift. When nuclear armament is in play, that is just not the kind of gamble you take. The crisis in Berlin touched off the Cold War, a struggle between the United States and Soviet Union that would last nearly half a century. To shore up its position, the United States and 11 other capitalist nations formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1949. NATO was a permanent military alliance designed as a bulwark against further Soviet aggression. Six years later, the Soviets countered with an alliance of their own, known as the Warsaw Pact. And before long, nearly the entire world had chosen sides in the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. By the year 1950, the Cold War really began to heat up. 
This is our third big idea. American commitment to the strategy of containment drew the United States into a violent proxy war in Korea, one that set a precedent for American military intervention against communist interests around the world. Tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union were palpable by 1950, but neither side wanted to test the military strength or resolve of the other, at least not directly. Instead, the two sides squared off indirectly in a number of proxy conflicts between 1950 and 1990, throwing their weight into auxiliary struggles between communist and democratic interests around the globe. And America's involvement in these proxy conflicts was driven by the policy of containment. In 1949, the Soviet Union's largest neighbor, China, fell to a communist revolution that shocked the world. The spread of communism to China also seemed to confirm Truman's domino theory. And it appeared that the republics of East and Southeast Asia would be the next dominoes to fall. So the United States watched developments in Asia carefully. It was there, on the Korean Peninsula, that the first major proxy war of the Cold War began. Korea had been occupied by the Japanese during World War II. After the defeat of Imperial Japan, the United States and Soviet Union had divided the peninsula along the 38th parallel. The North was to be rebuilt by the Soviets, and a communist government was installed there, while the United States set up a democracy in the South. In 1950, however, communists in the North, bolstered by Soviet and Chinese operatives, crossed the 38th parallel in an attempt to unite the Korean people under a single communist government. Under his policy of containment, President Truman could not permit this, and the United States rushed to the aid of the South Koreans. For much of the next three years, South Korea, along with the United States and its NATO allies, fought the communist interests in the North. While the Korean War saw significant changes of territory during its course, neither side was able to hold on to the peninsula. And an armistice in 1953 ended the fighting and re-established the 38th parallel as the dividing line between North and South Korea. However, no treaty was ever signed, and a state of war still exists between the two countries. In the short term, American involvement in the Korean War realized its goal of containing communism. But it came at a cost. 40,000 American soldiers were killed in the action, and more than 100,000 were wounded. For the Korean people, the death toll was much higher. Estimates approach 5 million, and nearly half were civilians. American action in Korea also set the precedent that the United States would dedicate incredible human and financial resources to its containment strategy, a precedent that foreshadowed a much larger effort in Vietnam in the 1960s. But even as the fighting was raging on in Korea, new developments were changing the face of the Cold War. This is our fourth big idea. The Soviet successful detonation of a nuclear device in 1949 touched off an arms race between the United States and Soviet Union, one that led both sides to engage in a foreign policy strategy known as brinkmanship. Between 1945 and 1949, the United States was the world's only nuclear power, giving it the proverbial trump card in any potential conflict with the Soviet Union. However, the playing field was leveled in August 1949, when the Soviets successfully tested their first nuclear weapon. This achievement understandably put many Americans on edge. Both superpowers now possessed incredible destructive power, and both raced to build their arsenals. Throughout the 1950s, the United States and Soviet Union invested heavily in nuclear weapons technology, and each developed bombs of increasing size and at an alarming rate. In 1952, the Americans detonated the world's first thermonuclear device, which boasted an explosion over a thousand times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. The Soviet Union achieved their first bomb of that type only two years later. The apex of the nuclear arms race came in 1961, when the Soviet Union tested the so-called Tsar Bomba, the largest nuclear weapon ever exploded. At 50 megatons, it was more than 3,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima blast, and its shockwaves could be detected as they circled the globe three times. The nuclear tests throughout the 50s were intended as a show of force, a word of warning, but it was soon clear that the arms race would have no real winner. In 
and that any direct confrontation between the two nations could result in mutual destruction. The prospect of nuclear war became even scarier in 1957, when both sides successfully launched their first intercontinental ballistics missiles, or ICBMs. These rockets could carry a nuclear warhead to the edge of space and drop it on a target from hundreds or even thousands of miles away. The two nuclear powers were thus forced to pursue their foreign policy goals at the risk of triggering a cataclysmic nuclear exchange. Late in the 1950s, the Cold War came within 90 miles of American soil, when a communist revolution led by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara resulted in the overthrow of the Cuban government and the establishment of communism on the island. The close proximity of a communist nation to the United States was unnerving to many Americans, and the U.S. government responded accordingly. Starting in 1958, President Dwight Eisenhower levied a trade embargo on Cuban goods in an attempt to starve the communist regime financially, but Castro found a friend in Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, who had taken over shortly after Stalin's death in 1953. The Soviet Union became Cuba's closest ally, rendering the Caribbean nation the next major proxy arena of the Cold War. In 1961, U.S. President John F. Kennedy took even more drastic action against communism in Cuba. In April of that year, he authorized an invasion of Cuba that he hoped would inspire a counter-revolution against Castro's government. But the so-called Bay of Pigs invasion failed spectacularly, and it only served to increase tensions and mistrust between the United States, Cuba, and the Soviets. In order to fortify Cuba against further American attacks, Khrushchev deployed nuclear-capable ICBMs to Cuba, putting them well within range of the United States. In October 1962, the United States and Soviet Union nearly engaged in a nuclear exchange. This was known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Take a look. It's not hard to imagine a world where at any given moment, you and everyone you know could be wiped out without warning at the push of a button. This was the reality for millions of people during the 45-year period after World War II, now known as the Cold War. As the United States and Soviet Union faced off across the globe, each knew that the other had nuclear weapons capable of destroying it. And destruction never loomed closer than during the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis. In 1961, the U.S. unsuccessfully tried to overthrow Cuba's new communist government. That failed attempt was known as the Bay of Pigs, and it convinced Cuba to seek help from the USSR. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was happy to comply by secretly deploying nuclear missiles to Cuba, not only to protect the island, but to counteract the threat from U.S. missiles in Italy and Turkey. By the time U.S. intelligence discovered the plan, the materials to create the missiles were already in place. At an emergency meeting on October 16, 1962, military advisors urged an airstrike on missile sites and invasion of the island. But President John F. Kennedy chose a more careful approach. On October 22, he announced that the U.S. Navy would intercept all shipments to Cuba. There was just one problem. A naval blockade was considered an act of war. Although the president called it a quarantine that did not block basic necessities, the Soviets didn't appreciate the distinction. In an outraged letter to Kennedy, Khrushchev wrote, the violation of freedom to use international waters and international airspace is an act of aggression which pushes mankind toward the abyss of world nuclear missile war. Thus ensued the most intense six days of the Cold War. While the U.S. demanded the removal of the missiles, Cuba and the USSR insisted they were only defensive. And as the weapons continued to be armed, the U.S. prepared for a possible invasion. On October 27th, a spy plane piloted by Major Rudolf Anderson was shot down by a Soviet missile. The same day, a nuclear-armed Soviet submarine was hit by a small depth charge from a U.S. Navy vessel trying to signal it to come up. The commanders on the sub, too deep to communicate with the surface, thought war had begun and prepared to launch a nuclear torpedo. That decision had to be made unanimously by three officers.
The captain and political officer both authorized the launch, but Vasily Arkhipov, second in command, refused. His decision saved the day, and perhaps the world. But the crisis wasn't over. For the first time in history, the U.S. military set itself to DEFCON 2, the defense readiness one step away from nuclear war. With hundreds of nuclear missiles ready to launch, the metaphorical doomsday clock stood at one minute to midnight. But diplomacy carried on. In Washington, D.C., Attorney General Robert Kennedy secretly met with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin. After intense negotiation, they reached the following proposal. The U.S. would remove their missiles from Turkey and Italy and promise to never invade Cuba in exchange for the Soviet withdrawal from Cuba under U.N. inspection. Once the meeting had concluded, Dobrynin cabled Moscow, saying time is of the essence and we shouldn't miss the chance. And at 9 a.m. the next day, a message arrived from Khrushchev announcing the Soviet missiles would be removed from Cuba. The crisis was now over. While criticized at the time by their respective governments for bargaining with the enemy, contemporary historical analysis shows great admiration for Kennedy and Khrushchev's ability to diplomatically solve the crisis. But the disturbing lesson was that a slight communication error or split-second decision by a commander could have thwarted all their efforts, as it nearly did if not for Vasily Arkhipov's courageous choice. The Cuban Missile Crisis revealed just how fragile human politics are compared to the terrifying power they can unleash. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a prime example of Cold War brinkmanship, the practice of using the threat of nuclear war to achieve diplomatic goals. And while cooler heads eventually prevailed in 1962, it's easy to see how things could have turned out differently. And that brings us back to today's big question. What role does a powerful military play in our society? Does it make us safer, or does it simply make us more likely to go to war? Without a doubt, the modern world poses new threats to our security, threats that the country's founders couldn't have fathomed. In order to live up to the government's mandate to protect its citizens, the military has a greater responsibility now than ever before. And it seems common sense to ensure that the military is financially supported and physically equipped to meet any threat. But the proliferation of nuclear weapons during the Cold War posed a terrifying new threat to the country. And while nukes were never launched, the fragility of the peace between these two nuclear superpowers serves as an ominous warning to those who study it. The Cold War's early years were defined by the looming threat of doomsday. And without question, there are lessons today's leaders and today's voters can learn from these volatile moments. Next time, we'll look at the Cold War's effect on American society in the 1950s. See you then.